for the last couple of weeks, we have been delving into this idea of spiritual warfare and how we engage in this battle that is going on around us. I'm afraid sometimes many people go through life and don't recognize that there's a battle going on. They don't feel the oppression of the enemy. They don't understand what it means to stand firm in their faith and their understanding. And oftentimes that's displayed in the way that we live. We live as if the culture is what dictates everything around us instead of being driven, being aware of a different type of kingdom and being under the domain of a different type of king. And so we, rec- we don't recognize what's going on. And so uh, we have been trying to get us to kind of open our eyes to this battle that is around us and, and trying to talk about the ways in which we engage in that battle. Last week we said that one of the weapons that we use in this spiritual warfare is the weapon of evangelism. And we said evangelism is the call to make disciples. It is the ultimate way we follow the command of the Lord to love Him and to love others. You see, one of the most unloving things that we could do is to know the truth that Jesus has for every person and then hold it or hoard it to ourselves. It's like being a light that is, that is made to light up the entire room, but then putting it underneath a bushel so that no one can see it. We, we defined evangelism uh, in, in, a, in a unique way. We said that evangelism is the action of not only making God known to humanity, but also making humanity know God. See, sometimes we think it's just enough to herald, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And then we're glad when someone comes to faith, and then we, we kind of we drop off that conversation. You see, evangelism wasn't just about sharing the gospel, but it was the process of sharing the gospel and then making people understand what it is to follow God, follow the gospel. We said that, uh, that this is the action of the Great Commission. And we looked at a Great Commission passage in Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 18, where it says, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach. Here's the scope. So not only is there an action in the Great Commission, but there is a scope in the Great Commission. And it's that scope that we turn our attention to today. Go ye therefore and teach. What does the word say there? All nations, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, where? Even unto the end of the world. Amen. So evangelism is the action of the Great Commission, but the scope of the Great Commission is is to the ends of the world. Luke uh, rephrases this a different way in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 22, verse 43 through 47. And he's, here, here's what he says. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. That's the message of the gospel, right? Well, here's where the Great Commission comes in, right? And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached. That's evangelism in his name. Where? Here's the scope again. Among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now, why does it say beginning at Jerusalem? Because that's where they were. That's where they were. You see, evangelism starts where you are, but it shouldn't stop there. It starts with a conversation that you have with someone that's beside you or or around you or someone that you know, but it doesn't stop there. And that's where missions kind of picks in. That's what you hear us praying for our global partners, our missionary partners. It's because we understand that the Great Commission is not just about reaching those who live over the shrubs from us, but it's reaching those who live across the seas from us as well. And so we have a responsibility to engage the, the, the world with the message of Jesus, and we call this missions. You see, the Great Commission not only comes with an action, but it comes with a scope. We call the scope of the Great Commission's missions, and let me give you a definition of what missions is. Missions is the work of evangelizing 
that started with those we know, but must move to those we don't know yet. Mission starts with those that we know. Close proximity, right? But it must move beyond those that we know to those we do not know yet. In the words of one famous scholar, to infinity and beyond. Uh, No, sorry, wrong person, wrong person. Matthew says this, he says, to the ends of the world, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Mark says this in Mark 16, 15, to every creature. Luke in Luke 24 says, among all nations. John says, in the Gospel of John, he says, just like the Father has sent me, even so send I you. And Luke affirms in, Luke, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that it starts in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the uttermost part of the world. Acts 1, 8. Missions is the work of evangelism that starts right where you're at. It starts with those you know, but it cannot stop there. It must move beyond those we know to those who we don't know yet. That's what missions is. When it comes to missions, I think there are three truths that we need to understand so that we can fully get a a, a full glimpse of what God is talking about when he gives this great commission, when he, when he gives us the understanding of missions, there, there are three things we need to understand. The first thing we need to understand is the lostness in our world. The lostness in our world. We just watched a video about the people who have the least opportunity to hear the message of Jesus. The Joshua Project, which is something that you can Google when you get home, it talks about the different types of unreached people groups. That means that they have no church to share the message. Most of them do not know anyone who is a follower of Jesus, and there's relatively low opportunity for them to hear the gospel preached to them. And they have identified that in the world, there are 17,259 different people groups that are in the world. Now, let me just, let me just, let me just talk about this. For evangelism purpose, a people group is the largest group within which the gospel can be spread as a church planting movement without encountering barriers of understanding and acceptance. So they kind of identify this group of people. Ideally, people group would always be defined to mean a group of individuals in a group that understand each other reasonably well. So it has to do with language. Cultural and relationship barriers aren't so high that the transmission is seriously impeded. It has to do with religions. It has to do with castes. It has to do with religious traditions. It has to do with locations. It has to do with common histories and common legends that may be used to identify a group of people with similarities. So they have identified roughly 17,000 different people groups that live on our planet. According to the Joshua Project, and they've calculated all this information, more than 7,220 people groups around the world remain unreached. Meaning, they do not have a church in their people group to share the gospel. They do not know anyone who knows the message of Jesus. And yet, Jesus said that his message must be preached to all the world, to every people group. That equates to roughly 42%, 41.8% of the people on the world are in an unreached people group. Do you understand that the vast majority of people in this world do not have the opportunity to hear the message of salvation? 42%. That's a massive amount of people. Now, if you go on the Joshua Project, what you'll see is they identify people as those who have uh, no opportunity to hear the gospel message, those who have limited opportunity to hear the gospel. So we're talking about 41% that have no opportunity to hear the gospel. We're talking about another percentage of people who have limited opportunity to hear the gospel. And then it goes up to those who have great opportunity to hear the gospel. 
Three of the world's largest unreached people groups reside in one area in the continent of Asia. They represent three-fifths of the world's population. The countries that reside with the greatest unreached people groups are China, India. China represents one-fifth of the world's population. India represents one-fifth of the world's population. And another one-fifth of the world's population are those who reside in Muslim, in Muslim countries. The task is massive to take the gospel message to all people groups. But just because the task is large does not mean that it is too big for our God. We need to understand that there's a world out there that has no opportunity to hear the message of Jesus because there's no church, there's no gospel presence, there's no witness, the location is too difficult to get to. There, there are all these barriers in which keep them from hearing a clear presentation of the message of gospel. And sometimes we get to the point where we say it is just too much, the battle is too big. But remember what I said to you, that this goal of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is a spiritual battle. And in this spiritual battle, we have something much more than just our message to engage in warfare. So the second thing that we need to recognize is we need to understand that we have been empowered to accomplish this mission. Now, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here because I've got some other videos that I think you'll really find interesting about some of our global partners and what they're doing in their part of the world. But I do want to say to you, in a couple of weeks, we're going to examine what it means to have the power of God upon us as we are engaging in spiritual warfare. But I want to show you that the scripture actually says that when we engage in missions, we are supernaturally empowered to engage the enemy. Consider what we found in Matthew chapter number 18, verse, uh, Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to Jesus in heaven and earth. Can I say to you, there is nothing that we face here that is more powerful than God. Amen? We know that he is more powerful than that. And the Bible says that after his resurrection, there is a supernatural power that is endued for his message to go forth, right? So because he's been given the power, he says, go ye therefore into the world, go with boldness, go with power, move forward in strength, advance in the kingdom of darkness, right? Wage war, not with a sword, not with arrows, not with a battle ram, but with the gospel. Move forward with the power of the gospel. Go ye therefore and teach the nations. Make me known. Baptize them and teach them to observe. Make them know me, right? And then notice what it, what it says next, right? It says, as you go, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And because I have been endued with all power, guess what? I am going to go with you. Did you hear that? I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to go with you. And so when you go to engage in the message, when you go to, uh, to share the message of Jesus with your neighbor, yes, but also with those you don't know yet, the Lord says he is placing his power upon you by his presence. Luke says it this way in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. He says, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And once you receive that power, it will empower you to be a witness to me, both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and then all the way to all the unreached people groups of the world. Is that, is that the way you understand that? Unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm giving you the power to move forward. Why? Because the Lord knows this is a spiritual battle. The Lord knows there's an enemy out there that wants to keep people blind and in darkness. He wants to keep them under his domain, in his kingdom. And so when we go to share the gospel, when we reach out across the seas to share the gospel with people that we don't know yet, there is a battle that is waging. We need to recognize that we're engaging in spiritual warfare. 
the Lord does not ask us to do anything for which he does not empower us to do. Do you hear me? The Lord has called you and commissioned you and empowered you to take the message to your neighbor, yes. To those you know, yes. And to those whom you don't know yet. Let that truth sink in a little bit, right? The Lord doesn't call you to do anything he doesn't empower you to do. And in the many ways that it impacts your heart and your life. This means that we can say things like this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Because he has empowered you with the presence of his spirit that says wherever you go, I will go with you. I have empowered you to step forward. So I have been empowered. You have been empowered to do the work of missions. Well, what is missions? Missions is the work of evangelism that started with those we know, but must move to those we don't know yet. And so I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that we must engage in missions. So once we have a good understanding of the lostness of the world around us, of the power in which God has given to us to make a difference, we must engage in missions. I was reading this week uh, in, in, in a book, and I, 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 I found this. It says, just as he, that is Satan, the enemy, lured Adam and Eve to think about their own wants over God's command, Satan delights when churches turn inward and ignore the needs of the world around them. We must engage in the work of missions. So how can we engage in the work of missions? Well, one of the ways that we engage in the work of missions is through prayer. We pray for our missionaries. You just listen to the Campbells and one of their parishioners invite us to pray for them, but not just for them. Invite us to pray for Wales, that people would be drawn back to Christendom. And so there is a need, even in Wales, to be, to be praying for our missionaries and praying for those who are reaching out. He also mentioned something else. We need to partner financially with missionaries. You see, for most people who leave the United States of America and go to a foreign country to reach the people, they cannot work a job. They can't just get another job and, 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 and start to uh, get some income uh, like we would just move to another city here and start a church and get a job and, and try to reach that. When you go to a foreign country, most of them have to be fully supported so that they do not take any resources away from, the, from that country of origin. And so we financially support missionaries so that they can go to places around the world with the message of Jesus. And so we're supporting them with prayer. We're lifting them up. We're supporting them financially. But as you saw in this video, over and over and over again, people were not only praying and not only financially supporting, but they were actually going to the mission field to partner with them. This is the ways in which we engage. I think it starts with prayer, and I think it becomes fuller as we begin to financially support missionaries. And I think it really comes home to roost when we actually go and do the work side by side with the missionaries. Over the years, our church has taken many mission trips to do exactly this, to, to distribute information or to help with building repair or to run a, a, an event of some sort. And the truth is, is that God has called us to engage and he has said to us, wherever you go, I will go. You will not go alone and you will not go empty. I have empowered you to do the work of missions. The work of missions starts with evangelism by sharing the message of Jesus with those we know. But the scope demands that we even share the message with people with whom we don't know. Again, the request to make him known by our partnership with them is a vital component 
to this idea of missions. It is clear that we have been called to reach beyond our neighborhoods to share the gospel. Yes, it has to start with evangelism. I have to share the message of Jesus with the people whom I know. But it doesn't stop there. The Bible invites us to engage in evangelism with those we do not know yet. How do we do that? How do we do that? We engage. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for the world, for those unreached people groups who have no one to share the message with them. We financially partner with them. At our church, on the offering envelope that you've received today, there is an opportunity every week to give something to missions. There's an opportunity to give once a month to missions. There's an opportunity to give in special offerings that go specifically toward missions. There's opportunity for us to engage financially. Don't miss that opportunity. Some of us may say, well, man, that's difficult to do. But I want to remind you that the scripture command to be a missionary also comes with the comfort that he will be with you, that he will empower you to do that. And then there will be times for us to go. I don't know what level God is inviting you to engage when it comes to missionary mission work, but I want to let you know, you can do it, and you have been called to do it. And when you do, you engage in spiritual warfare by taking the message of Jesus beyond our neighborhoods, reaching around the world, so that the nations of the world may know Jesus, and so that the nations of the world can also find him as their savior. You see, mission starts with evangelism by reaching out to those we know, but it must also be a reach to those we don't know yet. Let's engage. Let's move forward. Let's do something so that we can reach the nations of this world with the message of Jesus.